We should hear from Eric Wad. It is my pleasure to welcome Eric Wad to the stage. Eric is working for Axaway and he is architecting APIs. He also has a show on YouTube about getting them to work. Eric, the stage is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Julia. I think I'm going for the Baby Yoda Lego. That sounded very intriguing. <laughs> Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. And um, what I want to do today is to talk about how APIs change software development. Just a little bit about myself before we jump into it. So my name is Erik Wille. If you want to follow the slides online, just go to my Twitter timeline. You can find me on Twitter under DRET, the R-E-T, and I just posted the link to the slides as my last or second last tweet. And then you can look at them in your browser and they're all interlinked. So you can follow some of the links that I put into the slides. Okay, so like I said, a little bit about myself. So what am I doing? I am a computer scientist by training. I worked in academia for a long time, actually. And about 10 years ago, I started working in industry. And since then, I've been working in various companies and always in the API space. And what I do is I help organizations to make the most out of APIs. That's pretty much my, my job. What I have been doing before, up until like a year or now it's one and a half years ago, I did a lot of traveling and speaking, working with customers, traveling to a lot of conferences and just trying to be part of the API community. And like all of us, of course, some of that didn't happen anymore. I'm still here and so are you, that's really nice. But all of our lives have changed a little bit. And what I've done is to still do a little bit of outreach. I've poured quite a bit of energy into creating content on YouTube. So if you're interested in APIs and you're interested in interviews and, 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 and just conversations with people working in the API space, please check it out. And I do all of this as part of a team at Xway. Xway is a software company. Our products are in the API management and API platform space. And the team is relatively small. There's just six of us. And our specific mission is not so much to help with our software, but to really help with APIs themselves. So the way I like to do it is to tell companies how to do the right thing with APIs. Because like so many things, like you can use APIs in good and maybe not so good ways. And we want to help organizations to use APIs in a good way so that they get the most out of it and they're happy. And that's good for us because that's where we are um, selling our products. And one of the things that I've realized when working with companies in the API space is that software development really has changed in the last, let's say, 20 years since we've moved more and more from just developing software as kind of self-contained things and more and more developing these components that are always talking to other components and building platforms and doing all of this in a way that is much more a, an idea of where we build one huge ecosystem of communicating components and not so much one thing here, one thing here, one thing here. And what I think is that this really takes a little bit of a change in mindset for developers and for, for everybody else as well. But I wanted to talk about that a little bit and kind of highlight some of the differences that I think are important. And I will also at the end give you a little bit of a, let's say a little bit of guidance and some simple ways how you can try to transition into this idea more of not just building a single thing, but building something as part of a bigger ecosystem of communicating components. Sometimes when you talk about APIs with people, you get this very, very strong vibe of them saying, I don't even know what APIs, what the whole thing is, right? It's kind of old wine and new bottles. It has been around forever. And of course, when you look at the history, if you look at the earliest mentions of APIs, it's kind of in the late forties actually, so when they started developing computers, very quickly you would have an operating system and a program. These had to talk, so you needed an API. And then in the 50s, when they started to have the first network computers, it also became clear that, yes, if you have two computers talking to each other, they also need to somehow communicate, so that's an API. 
So on the technical level, yes, they have been around for, I think you could say 70 years now. So they're definitely not a new thing. But I think what has changed, and that is not so old, is that APIs nowadays are much more, I think, a business strategy and not so much a technology. Meaning that the idea of APIs and where they really shine and create the most value is to not just use them as a technical way of connecting to components, but to really use them as digital building blocks and to make sure that what you build is always built on something else so that you can quickly build something new. And if you want to change it, that you can just add something new. And the better you are at doing that, the faster you can build new things and the more you get out of your landscape of these digital building blocks. And I think this is really where there still is a lot of potential. It's not so much just using APIs, but really using them in the right way. And I think really this is where this difference is the most striking that we have to change from just building one thing to understanding that whatever we build in today's digitalized organizations has to be just one component in a much bigger ecosystem of things. And we always have to think about how we are the best possible component that we can be, not just like the thing, single thing, but how are we the best possible thing that fits into it that can be reused and so forth. And one of the things that people have been talking about a lot are platforms. And there's a myriad ways of how you can interpret that word. One of the things that I like to point out is just this fascinating story, I think, of platforms in the car industry. When you look at the car industry, it's amazing how the car industry has figured out how to build many more cars per year or per cycle than they used to because they have figured out a way how they build platforms and then they build a whole bunch of models around those platforms. So they have found a really good way of making sure that it's not every car, it's not a complete ground up exercise where they design every single thing, but instead they only design those things that need to be designed specific for user experience, for the people who should be interested in that car. And then there's a lot of commonality underneath. And typically when you look at today's cars, car companies, they might have four, five platforms that they have for a little smaller, a little bigger, maybe the, uh, the classical ones and the electric ones and so forth. But it's, it's pretty amazing how they have managed to do that. And I think this is really kind of the model that we should have in our minds. And in order to do this, I think one of the most important things is that APIs really strive when you have as many as you can have, so to speak. Of course, I, I don't want to say, you know, just generate APIs blindly, but the point is APIs are about connecting things. And whenever you connect things, one of the really important parts that or components in that picture is the network effect, meaning that the more things I can connect, the more I can build with those things and the more valuable it becomes to have this ecosystem of things I can build with. And betting on this network effect, I think this is something that sometimes is really not strong enough in organizations where they kind of still treat APIs a little bit as a luxury and saying, oh, well, I don't really understand why I should do that. I have enough other things to do and the API maybe if I have time, I'll actually create one but I won't really care about how it's designed and how easy it is to find and all these kind of things. And I think this oftentimes really means that this network effect can't really take off as much as it could. And it's important to think about how you can improve that. And one interesting thing and very interesting story. And if, if you're interested to dive a little deeper, check out the video I did with Micah Minson recently about the, Jeff Bezos API mandate, where we talk about that in a little bit longer form. But briefly speaking, right, in 2002, which I think is amazing, it's almost 20 years ago, Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, issued this mandate of five rules. And in the end, if you look at what it did, it just said, Amazon is going to be an API platform. Everything that is built at Amazon must have an API. It's not a second thought. It's not something that you do when you still have time. It has to be done for every single thing. 
And when you look at what this does, I think it actually is pretty amazing because one of the important things that it does, and that is in particular important for really large organizations is to say that if somebody wants to use some, something that somebody else built, if they want to use a capability and want to integrate that into their product, into their experience, into their website, into their mobile app, they can just build on that other team's API. They don't need to have a meeting and figure out a way how to integrate those two things and all of this. All of this overhead and all of these delays go away because if you have APIs for those things, now you really have digital building blocks that you can play with. And I think that is a really powerful thing to do. And I think it's also one, of course, it's not the only reason why Amazon is so successful. But I think one of the things that Bezos definitely understood was to say that if I want to do this, I have to do it right. I can't just go in there and say, well, yeah, we'll have some APIs, but not necessarily for everything, because then you're missing out on the network effect. So if you're going this way, the most you get out of it is if you say, okay, we're going all in. We're doing these API things as our way of how we build system. We will now always contribute to the set of APIs and that is what every team is doing. And then the, the famous sixth item in that Bezos API mandate was, I don't have it in here. It's like, anybody who doesn't do it will be fired. So that's kind of the Amazon way of motivating people, I guess. But I think this really is, when you look at this, this really is the one thing that as software developers, we still often have kind of, and I, I love actually the name of craft, you know, the craft conference. But I think it also shows us, right, that we still have this idea of everything we build is this precious and unique and wonderful thing that we built, right? It's, it's a craft that we have. And we don't think that much of ourselves as, yeah, we're just building another component that becomes part of that big platform of building blocks that everybody is contributing to. And I don't really think it has to be something negative to think about it that way, but I think it is a different mindset to think about how, what changes for me as a developer when I'm not just thinking about what I'm building, but also thinking about how can others build on top of it? How can I build on top of what others built? And to make this one of the most important things to think about and not just as kind of a side effect of building something and yes, I need to use some APIs, but in the end, that's just kind of a side effect of what I'm doing, right? No, this has to be a really important thing to do. And there are ways how I think you can learn more about how to do that in a good way. So a little while ago, when we worked on the continuous API management book, we came up with this whole bunch of things in terms of what does it take to be a better developer in, in that kind of environment? So to, to create software that is really working well in an environment where it depends on other software, right? And these are all the thoughts about, am I just blindly building dependencies or am I using those always only if I really have to? Because it's always a risk, right? Each dependency is a risk. So do I think about that risk? And do I make kind of an evaluation? Is it worth it? How easy would it be to replace that? There's many stories around dependencies that kind of disappeared and then how do you fix that? Right? So it can be hard. How do you deal with redundancy? So is there a failover that I can get to resilience? What do I do if that service goes down? Do I have a plan on how my service can still maybe operate in a slightly de degraded way, but it's still operational? Am I building the right granularity of things, right? So that I build what I have to build and I have dependencies with our components. Am I properly isolating the things that I am, that I am consuming so that if I switch in other things, then I can basically keep that to the API layer only. And then do I also have the tooling in place that helps to better manage this kind of, that relatively um, 
interwoven network of communicating components, right? And I think all these things are a little different from what we used as software developers, because now suddenly we are just one component in this bigger network of existing components, and we make it an important part of our practice to, to be a good component, not just to be a good thing, but to be a big team player. And you can think of it as really with every decision that you make, and, and I have just a car seat here because it could be one of those things going back to the car analogy, right? Saying that, oh, we've built the greatest car seat that we've ever built. Maybe we should build it in a way that it can also go into other models, right? And this is the kind of same thinking that I think we need to have more and more in software developers thinking about, yes, I'm writing this logic, this component of my code, and I need it and it's good and it's useful and it's a good product that I'm building, but it always could be made better. It could be presented in a different context. It could be presented in a different channel on a different device. How easy do I make it to reuse that thing in a different content? And I think this is really important to always keep that in mind. And this is where we see, I talk to a lot of really big organizations, right? This is where I see more and more momentum in these organizations coming up saying, yes, we need to have a better way of how we can find and consume those building blocks. And now we can ask ourselves, how can we become better at doing that? How can we as developer change our attitude and our approaches a little bit to be better at doing that? And I think one of the important things there is to really think about whatever you're building is only as good as the API that it has, because that essentially is the value that it has on the platform, right? If, if your product doesn't have an API, it basically doesn't matter in the ecosystem of the organization. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind and to think that Thinking about my product's API is a really important part to think about my product. It's not just a kind, some kind of byproduct. It's, it's really important because this is how it will be consumed by others, by applications, by, by other components, by, by maybe partners, right? And this is all something that really is important for me to keep in mind. And in that, I think if you think about it that way, Right. I think it's really interesting to look at how is product defined as a word, right? So if I'm thinking about an API product, I want to build something that is an API product. That means I design it in a way that it is basically a commodity, right? It becomes something that is well-defined, that has a well-defined value where somebody can understand what they can do with it. They can consume it. They can do something with it. And this is something that we often still see not happening in organizations, right? The APIs are just kind of byproducts falling out of some generation thingies. They're not described, they're not documented, nobody knows what they're really doing. And then it becomes really hard to extract value from them, even though they technically may be available as APIs, but they're not available as actual products. And how can you build a better product? And I've come up with three very simple things to just keep in mind when you are designing your applications, your products, your software, which may help you a little bit. So one is always plan for extension. Never think about that what you're building right now is the best possible thing and that's how it will stay. Always think about that it can be and hopefully will be improved. It may be improved by you, it may be improved by others. And the easier the, you make to do that, to evolve that product to be a better product, the more the platform can actually evolve over time as well and can evolve in non-breaking ways. And this is, I think, a lot of these kind of cultural things that we still have to learn more about. It's like, what does it take to really do those things that I'm talking about here well. The second one is always plan for augmentation, meaning that what you have built has a certain value proposition, it's useful for some consumers, maybe not so much for others. So always try to make sure that it can be reused in a different context 
so that maybe some it can be deployed in a different channel to different consumer groups and so forth. And then it actually becomes much easier for others to build on your product, meaning that your organization as a whole has a much better starting point to incrementally refine products and to say, oh, this seems to work well, but now it's used by a slightly different user group. So maybe we should tweak it a little bit. How hard is it to do that? Right. And the easier that gets, the more you can do that and the more your organization becomes more agile, more flexible, more change friendly, all these things that we want to happen. And the last thing that I came up with, which I think you could actually turn that kind of into almost like a litmus test in terms of is my API design kind of at a good level is, is everything that is really part of my API of, of my, sorry, of my product value is everything automatable. Do I have APIs that I could build automation around everything? Because only if that's the case, only if you could build automation around everything that your product does, that's a very good indication that you really have good API coverage, right? Your API is not just exposing some things, it's really exposing everything that is of value. And then even though you may not want to automate all of it, I think it's a very good kind of, thought experiment to let you think about is my API good enough or should I improve it because certain things right now are not exposed through the API but it would be helpful if they would be because if I wanted to automate everything then those should be available as well and I think that is a maybe a good kind of mental exercise to go through can I automate everything about my product and with this, I'm done. What I wanted to talk about today was very briefly just point out that I think software development has changed because APIs has, have really forced us, basically forced us to go from building products to building building blocks, right? And think about what is the best way how an organization can evolve that API landscape and make sure that anything that gets built is built on the landscape, becomes part of the landscape, and then everybody becomes part of this shared responsibility of using and improving the landscape all the time. That's basically what you're doing. In many organizations, I think nowadays, there still is not that kind of full Bezos spirit, you know, where it's clear the clear mission is that Every team is building good APIs for anything that they do because this is how stuff gets done. This very often is still not the case. I talk to a lot of organizations where they have, where they don't have APIs or not good APIs and so forth. So it can take a little while for this to, I would say, um, sprout some roots. But we see more and more organizations at least understanding that there is potential there. And I think there is really still a lot of opportunity to be realized in, in lots, lots of organizations that are around. And in order to do that, I think what you really need, and this is my, my daily job, right, is make sure that you have a platform that makes it easy to find building blocks, that makes it easy to contribute building blocks, that makes it easy for teams to build the building blocks that they want to, as long as they build building blocks, right? So they should not have too many restrictions around how they build it as long as it has an API, right? That's, that's really the main point there, how they build it, where they deploy it. That is all something else, but there should be this platform that makes it easy to build, find, and organize those APIs. And one way, for example, of doing that, what you could do is you could have, you could have something like a building block of the week, right? Where every week in the organization, you say, look, here is an interesting API. Here is, this is the API that is underlying one of our most successful products. Check it out, everybody. Think about maybe you can build something new around it. Maybe you can augment that product. Maybe you can do something cool with it. But just highlighting the fact that, look, all the stuff we do is based on APIs. That's what we should all be doing. And have some cadence where you do that so people get used to this idea of, yeah, sure, if it's around, it has an API and I can use it. 
that should be again right the default thought process that people are using okay and with that once again thank you very much for joining if you're interested in looking at the slides you can find them at the uri that you see here if you want to find more about um, about myself I'm on Twitter, you can find me on YouTube, check out my channel, and of course, I'm also in LinkedIn. And with that, I'm done with my presentation and I'm looking forward to some questions. Thank you, thank you, Eric, for this uh, talk. It was a really, really, really mind-blowing perspective on APIs. It's really important to have that perspective. I think everyone, please go to the QA and ask all the questions. I'm pretty sure all of you have a lot of questions. Uh, and don't forget that for all people who are writing questions, they automatically participate in a raffle to win a Google Smart Speaker. Uh, not that you need any incentive for uh, questions after this presentation. Yeah. But uh, it's, not, it's not the baby Yoda. Uh, there's a strong competition. Here's this thing. Okay. Competition. I had some questions on my own, but there's already questions. Uh, well, let, let me give uh, the audience a minute and let me push forward my question. Uh, sure. I am, for a living, operating APIs that are mostly consumed by computers. It's very, very obvious what is the use case and value for putting, heavy out, uh, putting out an API for something that has obviously heavy automation. Where do you see the line? Uh, for benefit or the main value for services that are mostly consumed by humans and not cons not computers. Well, in many cases, um, th these are services where people have built applications, right? And in many cases, for example, nowadays, when you look at what companies are doing, they build some, let's say, some mobile app. And a lot of value, a lot of the useful things that the application is doing is, is hidden in that app. And if you now, let's say, you want to do let's say have the same experience for a different mobile app or for a web app or for a different channel, right? It's sometimes it's really hard to, to extract that information from, from that mobile app because it's very kind of monolithic, so to speak, right? And, and, and there it's already a very good idea to say, if I build a mobile app, very likely it has a back end and a front end. That's like a typical design that you'll see. And that API between the back end and the front end should one should be one that I have specifically designed to be accessed by others as well, right? So don't just kind of build that as a generated thing where you kind of just access a database on the server. Really build an API for it, which will take some effort. It's that's sometimes I think the part that people misunderstand here. APIs at that point are not making things necessarily. Um, cheaper, mm -hmm. right? But they they create more potential. So they are an investment into the landscape of things that you can build over time. And I think that is sometimes the part where people kind of get a little bit confused. It's a very, very convincing answer. <laughs> Thank you. Now let's turn to the Q&A. Matthias uh, Reparas, I hope I am pronouncing their name right, asks, even if you have a great API, of one component, sometimes it's important to compose these components. How do you achieve composability? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. It um, depends a little bit on your preferred API style. So one of the things that I find interesting personally is, for example, hypermedia APIs, where you can say, if I have different APIs that do different things, but I want them to be easy to be composed, then I might design them as hypermedia API where one thing in one API actually links to another thing in a different API. And then somebody consuming all these APIs together has a relatively easy way to follow those links across a variety of APIs. So that's one pattern that, that you can use. And another, maybe another thing to notice is to also say that um, there are a lot of API guidelines out there, right? So a lot of organizations have some guidelines that talk about how the APIs generally should look and feel, so to speak, that are designed within the organization. And that typically also helps because that means if you have four different components that are being designed, they kind of, you know, look and feel the same because people are following the same general idea of how to design APIs. So, so you need a little bit of a 
the shared culture of how you do these things and and having guidelines and having everybody contributing to them and discussing about them is is one of the important things where this this culture can evolve over time it's not code style api style uh klaus uh polenka had uh i think pertaining question he says thank you very much for the presentation and he asks what is your preferred technology for designing and impl implementing hypermedia based apis i probably should not answer that <laughs> for designing them i have to say <laughs> no i mean that's definitely for hypermedia i think we still are there there where we have not that many technologies so to speak so there's hell and there are some other formats around hypermedia apis personally i think if you create hypermedia in a really simple way and you design them in ways that are very similar to actually kind of sitemaps you know where you say which things are connected in my data model and then I think one of the really nice APIs that I've seen and that that I that I helped design is uh, just basically regular JSON and just say you know like some of some of the properties in my JSON are just links and that's um, fine. So I think hypermedia, if you don't take it very far, so to speak, like there's some very sophisticated ideas what to do with hypermedia, but if you do kind of like relatively basic hypermedia, then just using JSON is actually working pretty fine. Okay, I will make note of that next time I build an API. Bela is Bela Buick, Buick, sorry, is asking. Uh, very often at the beginning of a project, there's a pressure uh, to push out an MVP very quickly and uh, for to get our user feedback ASAP. Uh, how do you build an API at this very early stage? That's a good question. That is also a question of what the product is that you're building. In many cases, if it is a product that has a UI, then in many cases, it's a good idea to say the UI that I'm building is consuming an API, right? That could be a rule that you just make for yourself and say, I don't, I never build UIs that are just there. I always build UIs that are consuming APIs. And then you kind of have, by default, you always have an API. That, and again, I, I said that before, that actually may mean that it takes a little bit longer. But on the other hand, if you do believe in the value of APIs, then that's an investment that you should make. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the questions. And sure. uh, as I want, what's the best way to document an API? Also some problem I often encounter. <laughs> yeah, that is um, so. That's that's also a very good question. So documenting, I mean, there's whole conferences around the API documentation. Right? I think one of the things, for example, that I see still a lot, and I'm, I'm trying to change that, but a lot of documentation for APIs nowadays is very much, it's very tech focused, right? It really tells people, well, here are those resources and here are the HTTP methods that are supported and these, these parameters and so forth. So it's it's very technical documentation, which which is fine. You need that, but what that kind of documentation is completely missing is really documenting what's the value that I can get out of this API, right? What what can I do with this thing on the business level? Like if I just want to build a new user experience, if if I want to build a new product and get access to maybe some capabilities or some data that I know that we have. How can I find that? How is that documented? And I think having documentation that is a little bit more focused also on the value and not just on the technical details, I think this is something where we still have um, a little bit to learn. But I think that's, that's where over time, because if we believe that APIs are very valuable as these building blocks, then I think we also have to say, well, then I should describe the value of that building block and I should say what it does and when I can use it and what it will do for me. And, and then I need to find out how to actually use it, but that's like step two, right? Thank you. Um, there are two more questions and we're actually running out of sure. time. One is really quickly, really quick, and it's an asynchronous question. Uh, Jolt Ola asked that, 
uh, he was not be not able to catch the end of the URL uh, https slash dread.net slash lectures shown at on the last slide. And could you please share the full link? Uh, oh, yeah. Lectures slash craft dash 2021. Or you can just go to my Twitter profile. My Twitter name is dread, D R E T. And my last link, I think, has, has a link to it. So my last tweet, I mean, has a link to it. Thank you. And there's this one, one last question, which is publishing and maintaining an API or well, anything that is published is an ongoing expense to maintain it. Uh, do you have any tips to reduce this expense? Um, not really. I, I mean, it's, it, it is, if, if you want to, if you believe that these things have value and should evolve over time, then again, this is an investment to make sure that these things actually do mature in a, in a way that still keeps them findable and usable. And it's really the more the, the bigger the organizations are that I speak to, right? They, I have so many people who tell me, we know we have so many valuable and interesting things that are available somewhere but we have no idea where that is and how to find it and how to allow others to find it, right? And that is, I think there you see this kind of imbalance between on the one hand, there is a lot of value that is technically usable, but then you just don't find it. And that's really, it's kind of sad to see that. And again, this, I think it is an investment over time that you say, we believe in the value of, making those things findable and usable. So we invest in the platform and we think that this will help us to be a better organization. So yeah, once again, I'm not really a cost saving answer, but I think that's <laughs> that's no, the best way to, can, to manage that. You can the deal by saying, by, by emphasizing what you're getting for it. Um, thank you so much. I think that these were all of the questions. I really hope I didn't miss, uh, miss miss any of them uh thank you so much again for the talk uh we would like to ex express our gratitude with a little something i hope that the colleagues can uh show us what uh we prepared for you it's uh custom made custom made oh uh, Ooh. <laughs> you are likely good on it <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I um, want it. I, I hope you will have will take away sweet memories from craft again. Uh, this was thanks a lot for for having me. That was fun. It was such a pleasure. And congrats for your first MC session, Julia. Very well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.